and then we'll get going. There we go. All right, so my name is Jason Klein. I'm with Logic Forte. And today we're going to be talking about using the Google Distance Matrix API to calculate the mean time to lunch, which happens to be an appropriate lunch talk since we're probably all wondering how many minutes it's going to take to get our lunch. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, it's, uh, we're also going to talk about Google Maps APIs and things like that. So hopefully this will apply to um, uh, a lot of folks that are involved in web content and web front end. How many of you uh, are involved in either editing or creating web content? OK, quite a few. How many of you are involved in designing front ends? OK, so in both cases, there's an opportunity to interact with uh, some of these APIs. And we'll cover some things that uh, you might have run into in the past and um, uh, help you understand um, the best practices in terms of setting up some of these uh, credentials and such. Um, a little bit of background with the project uh, that I pitched. Uh, we used Google Distance Matrix API to calculate uh, how long it would take for a group of members of the IT association uh, to travel to lunch at a few different potential lunch spots. Um, this was a few years back. I um, um, was pretty impressed to find how easy it was to run this and to see um, the group as an average would take this many minutes to travel here, this many minutes to travel here. And um, I mean, the short of it is, uh, that ultimately did play a factor in deciding where they met for lunch because they narrowed it down to a couple and one of them was way more convenient than the other. So we ended up meeting there for several years. Um, <clears throat> we're going to cover how to prepare your addresses for the API, how, how to interact with the API, and then how to analyze the responses. And by the way, I've got QR codes on all of these slides because um, all of this, the slides, the code, everything is out on GitHub. So you can go back and run any of this today and interact with either the number crunching that I'm demoing or, or some of the other API calls that I'm making. Um, a little bit more about myself. I mentioned I'm with uh, Logic Forte. Uh, I have an IT uh, and hosting and software background. Um, I've really shifted from the IT side of things to software here in the last uh, three or four years. and. Um, so anytime you have software questions and see me around at uh, Springfield Devs or anything like that, feel free to pick my brain. Um, also, um, la, outside of tech, um, uh, have a great family. My wife Pam is here today, and um, we have a little daughter, and uh, we like to go cycling, do Oktoberfesty things, which is coming up. Um, I apologize for not wearing my Oktoberfest get up, or maybe don't apologize, I don't know. Um, now, uh, a lot of you mentioned that you, you do work with front end uh, content or you build out front ends. So I'm imagining at some point, you, if you've worked with any Google Maps, you've seen this sweet background where they overlay the map with a thing that says for development purposes only. How many have seen this either on their own projects or just out in the wild? All right, well, um, for, for anybody who hasn't tackled this, um, basically what has happened is uh, you used to be able to plug Google Maps into your website, your web content, and use their API calls for free. Uh, you didn't have to create an account. It was absolutely wide open. Um, here a couple years ago, uh, they switched that model to where um, maps that were set up will show this overlay if they're still trying to use the free model. And we're going to walk through what that looks like in terms of setting up an account, plugging in an API key, and locking that down. So that you can um, get rid of this layer, you can make calls to the API, and um, um, not pay for somebody else to use your API key. Um, they, they do give uh, a couple hundred dollar a month credit towards Google Maps API, so all this stuff we're talking about, the Google Distance Matrix API and, and everything, uh, will usually fall well under that credit amount. Um, but um, you certainly wouldn't want your API key to be out in the out open where just anybody could make calls to Google Maps and start racking up a huge bill because you do have to associate a credit card with your account even though you have that little bit of buffer. So um, I'm just going through slides today to keep this quick. Otherwise, when I do live demos, I tend to drag them out and then it would not be called a lightning talk. 
So we're going to just bust through a few of these slides so that you can see what the setup process looks like. Um, you're going to go out to Google Maps. You're going to get started to create an account. Um, once, you're, uh, once you've plugged in all of that uh, user info and billing info, you're going to end up on a project page. Um, if you go up here to where it shows DevFest with the drop down, you can switch between projects. Traditionally, whenever I'm interacting with the Google Cloud API, um, we'll, we'll group different things under different projects. So um, for a couple different reasons, we can give back people access to different projects. We can um, manage billing by project, things like that. Uh, and then um, you'd go into your billing area and double check your billing things as credit card and such on that billing tab. Uh, we're not going to go into that and show you my credit card number. So once billing set up, we can start setting up API credentials. You'd go back to your project screen, go to the menu. Um, you'd go down to API and services and click credentials. This would take you to a screen similar to what you're seeing up here. Um, in this particular example, this is a dead key. So you're welcome to try to use it. Um, but um, normally the key that you see on here is secret. Um, when you go to create a credential, you can come back to this screen, you can grab the key. I usually name keys based on what I'm using them for, and then I'll divvy them up by function on a website. So let's say you're um, uh, helping somebody do something super basic, example, um, plugging in Google Maps on a WordPress site. I would literally call it like WordPress map. And, and then if at some other point in the project, we needed a different API key, I would go in and create a separate one and I would call that something else. And the reason for that is you can also see activity per key, and that allows you to figure out where things are going wrong if somebody's abusing a key or something's just not working right. When you drill down in and create that key, um, I, I wanted to cover just a couple things here because uh, a lot of folks get stuck on this. Um, there are two different areas to, to look at here. Um, and I, my scroll down will be the next slide. So nothing's gonna actually scroll here, but at the top of the page, um, you can set application restrictions. In this particular case, I'm running code. The code in, in the GitHub repo just runs from the command line. And so I've locked down this API key to where I can only run that code from certain IP addresses. Normally when you're plugging this into say an Android app or an iOS app, you would choose the appropriate option. If you're plugging this into a web page, you would choose HTTP refer, which basically just means the, the URL of your website or the, the domain name of the website. And um, that makes it so that when your website is telling the client to call Google Maps or any of these other APIs, um, only your website can do that. Somebody else can't plug the key into their, their website and, and start racking up a bill on your end. If you scroll down, you can see the IPs that I had allowed in this particular case. And then the second piece that I want to cover on this page is API restrictions. Um, they'll allow you to restrict the key by type of API call. In this example, I'm only allowing this key to be used for the distance matrix API, which ultimately lets me give um, Google a, an origin address and a destination street address, and it will calculate the distance between the two. And the cool thing about Google distance matrix API is that you can provide multiple origins, multiple destinations, and you'll end up getting essentially a grid of data telling you the travel time between all of these different origins and destinations. And before I dig into the dashboard, just one more billing note with this, um, you can always go out and you can see how, how they charge for API calls. And normally with an API call, it's per API call because they expect the call to give you back a certain amount of info. This is a unique example in that they charge by element and they treat each of those origin to destination pairs as one element. So let's say you wanted to figure out the time to lunch for 100 people and you're considering five places. You'd multiply 100 times five, that would be 500 elements. And um, their charges work out to uh, five bucks per thousand. So you do want to keep watch out for that. And the code samples I provided, um, they, they only check one pair at a time, and then they buffer those responses locally. So when I go and keep running analysis over the data, I'm not having to go out and pay for it to tell me it takes 10 minutes, two seconds to go from point A to point B over and over and over again. And you'll see all that in my code. 
Um, now, once you've set up your API credentials and your billing and everything's live and you've started using the project, um, the dashboard will look something like this. We're gonna dig into code next, but I wanted you to have an idea of what the Google side of things looked like in terms of managing your, your API keys. You can see how it shows um, the number of calls over the last six hours and number of errors, which there were just a few, and normally those errors would be something like um, user denied. So if I tried to run the call and I wasn't on the right IP address, it would fail and that would register as an error. And then your latency. And um, the interesting thing about this latency graph is normally it'd be super, super low, but my awesome ISP was down this day, so I was using 4G and the latency was a little bit higher. All right, so let's dig into some sample code. This is a boiled down version of a request to the, uh, the Google API uh, for calculating uh, the distance in minutes from point A to point B. And when, um, without going through this line by line on every single line, the gist of it is we start by opening a key file. We don't put the key in our code. I would think most people probably appreciate that nowadays, but when I go to post this code on GitHub, I certainly don't want somebody to run across the key even if it's locked down. It's just not considered proper practice anymore. So we're reading that in, and then we're providing an origin address, and you'll see in this particular case, we're stripping out all punctuation, and we're replacing all spaces with pluses. Um, same thing with the destination address, um, and then you can see the, the raw API call. Um, we're calling this URL, we're adding some parameters like language and units, and then we can provide a set of origins, a set of destinations, and then the key. And then we get that response back, formatted as JSON, which is a lot like my name, Jason. So every time people talk about it, I'm looking to see if they're talking to me. And then we um, finally output that origin destination and they give us back the distance in meters and the round trip um, or the distance in minutes. And I'm rounding that off. So if we were to run this sample, the output would look like this. It show um, from our uh, event sponsor, O'Reilly's office, over to the factory, would be 748 meters of driving and 12 minutes. I know it says seconds, but it's minutes. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'm sure for them too. All right, and um, here's the raw output that comes back from Google. I mean, obviously what I just showed you is parsed out and sent to the command line, but when you're re reading the response from Google, you can see how they provide these element pairs. And in this case, there's just one showing that 4.3 miles and the 748 seconds or 12 minutes. All right, now uh, I'm gonna go on and, and talk a little bit more about the, the sample that I provided in GitHub. Um, and then I'm gonna um, explain the other code that's out there. Uh, I, I provided some sample member location data. Like let's say these are all of our members that we want to get to a lunch spot. And um, there are probably about a dozen there. And then I provided some sample event location data. These are places that we want to potentially send them. And, and the, the code the, in my repo will parse this in and it will create this sample output data. Uh, and this is um, pipe delimited, throw it into a Google Sheet, but it, um, it basically shows your origin and then the time of travel to each of these other locations. So you can see your first line is um, each of the locations and then each row after that is, is an origin and the distance to all of those locations. And then I prettify that in Google Sheets. Um, and I average out those travel times and you can see with this tiny example, if um, we were trying to set a location for, for this um, list of 10 people, we would want to choose 202 South John Q. Hammonds because that's most convenient for them. Uh, and the way I basically calculated that is it shows uh, that there's a 2.12 minute distance in average difference in average travel time between the most convenient and the least convenient, just looking at that 11.25 minutes versus the 13.37 minutes, um, which I thought was an awesome number, but I didn't make that up. And then we, um, if you uh, multiply that savings by the 10 members, uh, the difference is 
essentially saving 21 minutes for the entire group. Doesn't sound like a lot, isn't really a lot, it's a pretty small group. So let's look at averaging travel time for hundreds of members. Um, I mentioned that we ran this project for the IT Association, didn't think they'd be super keen on me publishing their member list, but I thought of another place locally that does have an online member list, the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce. Rockstars, they have a gold mine of 12 to 1400 members out on their website. So I went out to membership, membership directory, scrolled down, clicked on L to see if I could find any familiar names. Logic Forte was out there, looked at the code, and this is what that block of code looks like on their site. Um, I'm not going to zoom in on it, uh, on it, but the gist of it is shows the company name, shows the company address. So my sample code shows you how. I pulled down all of that data into a data file, and here's the outcome. I uh, ended up after eliminating out of area people, because I don't really expect a lot of their members from um, KC, St. Louis, out of state, or PO boxes to travel to lunch, and then um, ran it against the same list of potential lunch spots and got a quite different answer because it was a much larger sample. In this case, rather than 202 John Q. Hammonds, or the chamber office being the best location, um, we found that 600 West Sunshine, which is the Bass Pro Convention Center, was a far better choice. Uh, and the overall time savings versus a potential poor location choice in terms of convenience was four minutes, um, which when you factor that over 1,200 people, um, that would save the group 84 hours. And so at that point, that is making a significant difference in terms of just overall time savings. And with that, you can download any of the code that I talked about today out on GitHub. Again, scan that QR code or go out and visit me. Um, any questions? Yeah, if you want to ask questions later, that's great. I know everybody's busy eating. So thank you.